Hello everybody, this is Cecil Harwell, and today we're working on shading. I'm using Sketchbook Pro, and uh, we're going to do three or four different techniques. I'll just pick something simple, and uh, like coffee cups will work, or I'm using my bowls for my go board, or wooden bowls, and just make sure you have plenty of room. Oops. Clear this and start over, scoot back a little bit. Don't really need the menu or anything because we're just working in one tool at a time. So this first one, we're just going to do some hatching, right? So get your gesture. Just let it be loose. It doesn't matter. There will be marks, you know, pen marks on the final drawing because we're not erasing. We're using pen. We'll erase in a little bit. So, okay. I've got my basic shapes. So here's some negative. There's a negative shape right there. Uh, there's the edge of the bowl in the back. There's the edge of the front bowl. I'm just kind of going around the objects. Just re real loose and light. You don't need, you don't want to get too detailed too quick, like I always say. You're divorcing yourself from the image, and we're just going for a relationship of shapes to each other. All right, so there we go. So there are several different ways to shade, obviously, depending on what you know medium you're using for one. But also, you know, you can mix media, obviously, and get something very different. This time we're going to go for some finished work. So the first thing you want to do is forget, again, forget about the image, divorce yourself from what you see, and just go for the shapes of the shadows. So we're going to start with hatching. Hatch all the way across each shape that you see. And then the way hatching works is you're you're actually describing the surface with your lines. Now, every time you cross hatch, you divorce the surface descriptor from its surface and turn it into a an explanation of space, right? So if you want to bring something back into surface description, then you need to kind of use the angle that will imply that surface. Here, if we take a quick break from this, I can show you what I'm talking about specifically. Hatching is probably one of the most difficult techniques to master. So what's going on here is uh, what we call uh, visual literacy, right? Like we're, we as Westerners are trained to see an image in a certain way. Uh, so whenever you're hatching, cross-hatching, What's going on is the mind is assuming that the crossed hatch marks are a grid. Like we're looking top face down, top down on a surface, right? So whenever you make these lines, it doesn't matter what direction they go. Your mind is going to automatically assume that this is describing an arced surface. Now, <clears throat> let's say, for example, you know, we just make these lines like this. Surface description, right? And again, surface description. And again, surface description. And again, surface description 
and again surface description but without any more information we can't tell whether this is a concave shape i.e. going down across and then up or if this is a convex shape going out and then up right so the way to decide that would be to add like let's make it into some weird trapezoid well now it looks convex right but if we go the other way it now looks concave so In describing your surface, you want to keep this in mind. This is the basic setup, right? So now let's go ahead and add our cross descriptors. Again, looks like we're looking straight down, so as if this were the top of the t a table right and then here's a slope down another flat surface and then a slope up and then another flat surface All right, let's just go ahead and clear this <clears throat> with that in mind just go ahead and here you know what we're going to use the guide so we can get some crisp sharp straight lines let's see here guides Now this is kind of has some kind of perspective to it, right? Then if we take our crossed lines, it gives us a basic two point perspective. But as you can see, we do that one actually. There we go. Okay, now as you can see, these uh, we're imagining, the mind is naturally imagining that these are grids, right? These are squares, but because they're at angles, the mind automatically turns it into a surface, right? Like this. So instead of it being a circle face down, right, it's in a circle at this angle. So now, if we take, this won't come in exactly at a, if we take these intersection points, where the, like it took me years, I don't know if this is just out of stupidity or just because nobody ever told me or what, if we take these, uh, at first I thought it was the line that was describing the surface, but it's not. The line is uh, giving us a value, an area of light or dark in an area, right? The, uh, it's the squares that are giving us surface description. 
So, uh, this is actually here. Now we're averaging here because this these aren't quite, you know, uh, regular polygons. They're uh, they're off. So uh, what I'm doing now is adding the third set of lines. Well, that that's what I was talking about changing the hatching from surface descriptor. Now we see each one of these points. Oops. Back. Next. Now we see each one of these points as uh, an XYZ coordinate, right? Even though they're just sets of lines. So this appears like it's in front of this one even though it's defined by the same line. So I'll show you in a curved situation what I'm talking about here. Or, let's do this. Right, now it'll be a lot easier to come in here and just pick Should be right here, right here, right here. Now, <clears throat> all of a sudden, these XYZ coordinates expand the space, right? So now it looks like a space instead of a surface. Right, there's another one, there's another one. Right, so sets of parallel lines in uh, three different axes create space whereas sets of two line parallel lines create a surface description. Before we go back to our uh, image, let's uh let's look at three different ways here. We'll do it this way. So here's one, two, three. And this is an exercise you know you'll get in any drawing 101 class. Uh, now we want to I'm make these as close to uh, perpendicular as I can, but I'm not really worried about it. We're going to make six or eight. Of course, in a design class, whenever you're doing this assignment, they will t take off for lack of symmetry or you know perfection. They're 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 wanting you to you know use craftsmanship, right? So you want to you do want to make sure that you get all this right. But I'm just, for the purposes of demonstration, okay, it doesn't really matter. All right, so now we have, uh, uh, since we're talking about shading, I wanted to go ahead and show you how value works. Okay, so I don't need the line anymore. There we go. All right, we have free, free hand again. So value is the amount of light and dark in an area, DK. So light being 10, I believe, and dark being 0, or light being 0 and dark being 10. I don't remember off the top of my head, and I'm not going to take the time to look it up. But you get the idea. It's a it's a scale, right? So, but we actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That'll be fine. Uh, so white is blank. 
and then in the second sphere we're going to there's two okay so now we're going to put the lines a little closer together for three and then we're going to put the lines even closer together in four and then in five we're going to keep the lines the same kind of you know distance apart roughly but we're going to cross hatch then we'll do the same thing again keep the lines about the same distance apart cross hatch keep the lines the same distance apart then we're going to cross hatch again See how it's difficult to go back in and actually get uniformity. So it's better to just redraw the line or, or you know work it work in one direction. If you miss one, then back up. I mean in digital it doesn't really matter. So okay, so now in seven and eight. We're going to put them even closer together. See, there's an example. Okay, so I want to back up there. I'm going to redraw that line. Okay, that's a, still a fail in a design 101 assignment, but that's all right. We're not. I'm not taking a test. I'm not looking for a grade. I'm just trying to demonstrate a principle. So here we go with the lines closer together. Okay, and then do that again. We could have gone all the way across, I guess. Now see, I, ultimately you would want something maybe a little more uniform, but this, again, for demonstration purposes, we're all right, okay? And so then nine would be like this. And now we're just going back and forth. We're not doing individual lines. That's all one continuous line. And then for 10, We want something like this, right? Complete black. So that's how like a hatching shading works. So now we're going to go on to the pencil. And again, we have white here. So here are my pencils. I have a 4H, an H, a B, 2B, and 4B. Now, uh, H series is a uh, harder leads right so there's more clay to graphite the clay mixture is greater the proportion of clay in the mixture is greater in harder leads and in softer leads the amount of graphite to clay is greater so uh, it's just a, a matter of let how much graphite it's laying down so this is replicating that pencil setup right so one is going to be blank and then
H, 4H, you may not even be able to see. So I'm going to make it a little darker. But now we have pressure. So with pencil shading, you want to actually apply pressure. So if I do lightly and start applying more pressure, you're going to get a darker mark. B again pressure gives you darker mark not a wider line a darker mark <clears throat> I'll go to 2B that's a little dark so see we're gonna have to really focus on pressure in order to give the uniform gradation. That's the uniformity we're focusing on. We want a continuity from here to here. So this is 10% darker. This is 10% darker. This is 10% darker. This is 10% darker, and so on. So now we'll go ahead and put in 2B in a darker shade, right? Now I'm applying my pressure. So the first one in pen, the lines are uniform and we have no pre pressure sensitivity whatsoever, right? It's just a one pixel or two pixel thickness line and that's it. That's all we got. But with a pencil, we have the same, the line uniformity, but we have pressure sensitivity in the lightness or darkness of the mark, the value of the mark. So now... This is 2B, or 4B. And then we're going to go ahead and put black here instead of waiting till the end. All right, so now we're, pre we're applying all the pressure we can, and we're getting as dark of a mark as we can. <clears throat> okay. So there we go. That's a pencil shading. And uh, again, it's all about pressure. You want to have a really light touch whenever you're making the value closest to white. And then you want to be able to modulate that pressure, that touch, by when you switch to uh, H or from 4H to 2H or whichever. I have 4H, H, B, 2B, and 4B. It just gives me the widest scalar variation. Okay, so then we're going to shade with a brush. So here's our brush, right? Let's, uh, we're going to manipulate this mark a little bit, or set, define our brush settings. So spacing for some reason. Oh. There. Okay, there we go. I've reset the brush. So now... I'm going to turn opacity off. Actually. Well, or all the way on. And then... Give a better width, right? So now what we have is the color that we want to lay down without any kind of real uh, uh, value variation, whereas with the pencil we could vary the value right with our pressure. Here we don't vary the value with our pressure, we vary, we vary the line width, right? So, I don't know what this brush is actually doing. It's neat though, I like it. It's cool. So I'm going to leave it as is. So here what we do is, we, we like we're painting with a different colored paints. So now we want to pick our value. I had a black and white value scale here, but I like these colors. So uh, let's just start up at the top, right? There's white, so we don't need to paint white down. So let's just go, you know, 15% down so that we can paint in the value that we want, right? 
then we'll go another 15% down. And paint in that value. Then we'll go another 15% down and paint in that value. Another 15% down. Again, whenever you're making little, when you're performing this exercise of, you know, drawing out, use a ruler, you know, straight edge or whatever, and draw yourself out seven or ten evenly spaced, uh, evenly sized squares, right, or rectangles or whatever. And then practice, you know, filling them. So here, is this the same color? So now we're ready to switch colors again. It, different tools give you different results. So, like if you were actually doing this with live paint instead of digital, then you couldn't just scroll down the color wheel. You'd have to actually mix, you know, black and white, you know, in different proportions in order to get these variations. So then here's our second to last one. And then here's black at the bottom. Oh. There we go. Okay, so these are the three different techniques that we're going to use here. If we take a shader, I love these shaders. So, oops. All right, then we could blend these. We have puppies, and they're uh, right at the age where they're no longer cute little puppies. I mean, they're so cute, but they're hellions now. They're starting to tear up things and chew on things and get into things. And so if you hear that scuffling in the background, it's our puppies playing outside on the porch. All right, so with the paint, you can do this. This is like a, uh, this tool right here is a, a emulated shader or whatever. Okay. So I, the recording app that I have isn't the greatest, so you may not be able to see the value difference in these two, um, but it's there slightly. Um, then again, I, you could do this with pencil, right? So here, let's use the bigger... Pencil actually gives you a much kind of kind of more kind of more uniform. Ability to get more uniform. I like a paper sh uh, shaders, paper shading stumps, whatever you want to call them. There we go. So now we have this uniform shading across the spectrum. All right, that's what we're looking for. And then obviously if this were an actual, we could do this, you know, in digital. It's not cuz it's a pen. It's not a it's not actually ink on a surface so you can shade any medium that you're emulating but you know if you're trying to emulate pen marks which I like to do I like to draw with the pens because you once it's down you know you, there's nothing you can do about it it's, it's there so I'll go back and draw like with other colors even though I could never do anything like that you know on a actual piece of paper okay so this is what we're working with and I picked the hardest one to to show you on but uh, that's just because I wanted you to see that you could get it can be messy, you know, Picasso said you can't be an artist without making a mess. So I like that. I think it's true. 
and it's something I uh, like to live by. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go ahead and take the time to put in this uh, uniform background. Um, the go pieces are up on uh, the board. So we're not going, because I'm emulating pen here, uh, a pen, I'm not going to erase anything on this one. And I'm showing you the hardest technique first because I want you to, to kind of see what you're aiming for. You may never, ever, ever, ever draw with a pen and do hatching like this, but you would do yourself a disservice if you shied away from it. If it's not something that you think you would enjoy because it just looks tedious or difficult, just remember that there is such a thing as pointillism. Now, whenever you're shading with lines, always remember to go across the surface of your actual object and try to group value shapes. So, for example, I'm drawing, it connects the shadow of the thing with the object, so it doesn't just look like a uh, you don't want this break. See, this line is going to come in here anyway, this bottom of the bowl. I don't have to define it. Uh, the relation of shapes to one another will define it. it itself. And again, like I've always said, uh, you're not making something happen, you're allowing it to come. And so whenever you take that approach, you may wonder, well, what what decides which way you're placing the lines? And my uh, most immediate answer, obviously, I guess, would be intuition. Uh, that's the short answer. Uh, long answer is lots and lots and lots and lots of practice. Uh, it doesn't have to have any rhyme or reason. In fact, that can be fun. You know, I could be, uh, here, let's just do, let's do another layer here. I'm just going to, let's just scribble it. Let's scribble it real fast and leave all this stuff in. Okay, I want to, you know, get this line and this line and these lines and you know just let, let let's let the whole thing just come out in this kind of chaotic like or you know I like this like circle circular thing All right, there's nothing saying that you couldn't finish the entire thing like this you know just let it be all over the place let it, the you know chaos Let's see so, so this the same image is going to emerge cuz it's what's in your visual field, right, that you're trying to capture. And so if you just forget about the image and just blah, you know, just chaos everywhere, and just let it come out, well then it's going to happen. It's the, the same image is going to emerge. So now, you know, let's look back at this. So this is a little more ordered, but it's also a little clumsier. This has some life and vivacity to it. There's a you know, there's something about the line quality here. So, you know, I could go ahead and just, let's go back and do some refining on this now. Now that we've kind of exploded on it and it's got a little more life, let's try to keep from killing it. Because uh, I think I've said this, you know, in previous lessons that the what separates an artist from a craftsman is life. The ability to, a work of art is alive. So, if we can keep from killing this. Also, there's a tendency with lines like this right here. There's a tendency whenever you're, make, whenever you're working with a pen that you want to draw around the object. Well, don't do it. Don't do it unless there's an actual, like here, this is actually a dark, darker line, right? A darker mark. So now I don't want to uh, organize this thing to death. So 
I'm going to try to let those underlying construction lines, that chaos, that just free flow of energy, kind of, I want to respect that. I've said for a while, actually, that the art is a failure when it attempts to reproduce the original act of creation. So, if you think of the act of creation as sacred, then you want to respect the holiness of that creative act. So don't destroy it. Keep it alive. Let it breathe. Give it plenty of room. That way you don't you don't want to pin yourself in, especially with a pin <laughs> No pun intended. Uh, you don't want to hedge yourself, especially with pen, because it's a subtractive process. Do you guys know the difference between additive, subtractive, uh, drawing, or uh, image making processes? See, I didn't even use that as my underlying image, and I have almost the exact same thing right here. All right. Oh, I did have it underneath there. Well, let's do it. Why not? We'll just use both of them. So, uh, let's see here. So this uh, this is a subtractive drawing process. Here, we'll create another layer. So, a subtractive drawing process is one where once you put the mark down, it's down. You can't take it away. It's like a in a sculpture. A subtractive sculpture is taking a stone or a block of wood and taking out of it, right? Uh, so once you remove something, you can't put it back. That's subtractive. And it's the same thing with uh, drawing uh, or painting. Like a watercolor is a subtractive image-making process because, let's say here, we have some watercolor brushes, I think, in here. Actually, let's switch to Corel Painter real quick, and I'll show you... Uh, the semblance of watercolor, anyway. Oh, that's my current project here. Let's see. Uh, new, save. Uh, paint. Create. Alright, so here's our canvas. Let's pick our brush. We're going to stick with watercolor, so I'll go with that one. That's great. Okay, so now we're going to respect the watercolor effect, right? And we're going to not erase anything or blend anything. It's going to be pure, uh, uh, pure subtraction. So... Okay. Again, just gesture. This is if we want to draw at first, right? Or we could make the brush size even bigger. Here, let's switch brushes. I think that's a bigger brush. Actually, it's kind of small. You can draw with watercolor, or you can paint with watercolor. And now we're going to... That's bigger. It's not quite what I wanted, but that's alright. Okay, so we're going to draw with watercolor. Uh, so... Again, just keep it loose and open. Because the act of creation is sacred. And the only way to keep a drawing alive is to respect its holiness as a work of art, as a living work of art. Okay, so this is what I mean by subtractive process. So now I can't take any of this away. If it were an actual watercolor on watercolor paper, I'd be, uh, I'd be stuck with what's on the page. So that's what makes watercolor a subtractive process. You don't, once I put a mark here, it's down. So if I mess it up, well then I mess it up. 
That is why Bob Ross talks about uh, there being no mistakes, uh, simply happy accidents. And he's right. It's one of the things I love about Bob Ross. He was a real, a real master of the process. He loved to paint. And he was very, very good at it, just making that stuff up out of his head. Uh, so, see what I mean about going back and forth over the, this is a building process, right? With uh, watercolor in particular. So, there's this reflection right here. I'm going to cheat, just so that you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so this right here. There's a reflection off the off the board. So let's leave it. And on this side there's a reflection off the board. Uh, again, the nice thing, I was pressing real hard there for a little while. I'm just layering with uh, watercolor, it's opacity, right? So, uh, all most watercolors are traditionally uh, translucent. You have gouache techniques where you can, uh, where you have some opa some opacity, but don't let it fool you. There's not a lot of room to like you can't put something down with gouache and then paint over it and expect it to to recapture white right so it's just not possible you're, you're, you're always gonna you're gonna get something like uh, I'm trying to think of an example uh, well here I can show you this way all right, so I'm working with white, black, but I'm at what kind, what level of opacity? This is my opacity level, so I'm working at 18% opacity. Yeah, I had it on 18. There we go. That's close enough. So if I go back in here with white, right? That's the kind of gouache effect you're going to get. So you, it, it kind of gives you this ability to paint over black, but not. Not like you would want in, uh, like with acrylic, it gives you. That's an additive painting process or image making process. Uh, you can always put something down on top of it, is what that ultimately means. So I've now turned this into a gouache watercolor, which is a semi additive process, right? Because I can add, add white. But I don't really want to do that. I want to go back to black. So now we're just trying to capture the shapes here. And then obviously you can combine these techniques, right? Like I could could hatch this out. There is wood grain on here that's visible. So, but and I'd like to get to that level of detail, but we'll do that in another exercise. Right now, I'm just wanting to introduce you guys to the process of shading using multiple techniques. So, kind of all over the place. I don't plan these lessons out. I just say, okay, well, today I'm going to talk about this. And so here I am. Uh, I do have a subscriber. Thank you very much, subscriber. Hope you enjoy this. Uh, I, uh, it pleases me to no end to know that somebody, you know, is getting value out of this. So I have projects where, like right now, I'm practicing uh, doing Bern Hogarth studies, right? Uh, here, I'll show you guys. So, my Bern Hogarth study. Uh, sketchbook does this. It just dies with a, a save and exit. 
that it won't give me my menus or anything and I have to reopen it. But I'll go this way. So here's the Burn Hogarth book coming up, hopefully. Yeah, there we go. Here. And then... Okay, so this is what I've been working on. And... Yeah, see, it didn't even save that uh, pen sketch. But like I said, you don't don't get attached to your work. Let let it let it grow. Oh, come on, there we go. Okay, so you know you are, you're always learning. You never want to stop learning. So here's what I got so far. It's a master's study. I mean, Bernard Hogarth was most definitely a master. Uh, he has these uh, uh, drawing here. Where are they? Drawing dynamic hands. Uh, drawing the human head. Here's the drawing to dynamic hands. If you're not familiar with Bernard Hogarth, he's definitely somebody you could l spend a lifetime learning from. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Stan Lee actually was a student of Bernard Hogarth, like directly living in person. So, you know, these are great. They go through, define the planes, show you how the planes relate to each other, how the axes of the joints work, right, like this here. Uh, I love this stuff. And his uh, writing is great, too. He goes, he's very specific here. Uh, uh, the hand is not flat, two-dimensional shape without volume. It is dynamic, dimensional body, energetic and complex. Each of its forms and structures interrelated. In this chapter, we will look at it from various angles in space and depth, noting the curves and rhythms, and examining the bulk, sizes, shapes, and masses of the individual parts in their relation to the whole, which is what we're always doing, right? Even if we go back to you know, this drawing right here, or this painting, or whatever you want to call it, this image. You know, it's all just... A relation of parts to a whole, a larger whole. So this is about as done as uh, this is going to get for now, because uh, I want to show you. Okay, so here this is the if this is the subtractive image making technique. Then let's go ahead and examine the uh, additive. Uh, delete. Yes. Here, actually, let's just go ahead and close this. Discover. Um, okay. So, additive painting. Uh, Matte pencils really are more subtractive than additive because you can't put white on top of black. That's what really defines a, a image making process as black or white. Okay, so here we go. For example, here's black, right? So what makes this particular like acrylic or oil additive is that I can go right on top of it with white. And there's no, there's nothing stopping me. It's totally opaque, so I can always add to the painting, right? I can, uh, and here we can't really work with opacity. How would I make uh, a canvas anything other than uh, the the beige color of linen? So, for example, here let me clear this. That's more like the color of a canvas, or like that, or somewhere in there, maybe. Something like this. Right? So, in order to make it white, I have to take gesso, right? It's called. And I want to reset this brush here. There we go. Now let's make a uh, 
Oh, that's the pen. That's why. Okay, I'm gonna reset that one. There we go. Man, I keep. There we go. Why does it keep setting me on the pen? I wonder. What I'm trying to do is set this brush. Oh, there we go. Reset. Reset. There we go. Okay. So we're going to leave its opacity at the level it's at. But we're going to set the maximum and minimum, right? So we can make it large. That way we can paint, right? So now we're getting closer to paint, emulating painting. But so I'm going to pretend I take gessoing this canvas, right? Okay, so now we have white. Doesn't really matter, I could leave it gray. I'm just demonstrating that what we have is a additive process. So now we're not adjusting opacity or anything, we're just working with paint. So Let's go back to our our object, right? Whatever you have, I have these two bowls. So, bam! I'm gonna do it like that. Okay. I go ahead and paint behind them. Then I like to see a little lighter around the bowls. Actually, there's this. They're on the go board, so it's a little lighter. And then let's go ahead and put in our lights. Again, we're just relating shapes to one another. And because this is a totally additive process, I, I'm just looking for shapes. I'm going back and forth between a negative shape and a positive shape. I just want to get, there we go. So now let's go back to a darker color, a darker shade again. Uh, okay. Keep coming back to this size right here. I don't know why. If it goes off the page, it goes off the page. I mean, you could reset it or redo it or whatever you want. You could redo it a million times. That's the thing about art. Like, just learn right now to not get too attached. And always start over. It's just an image. Okay, so now the beautiful thing about this, okay, so that needs to be darker. Let's go ahead and go in. I like to adjust them like this, just a little bit at a time. And then, uh, I've said this before, but it bears repeating. Uh, in my figure drawing class, my professor was like, don't get too detailed too quick. I'm, you're getting bogged down in these eyes and fingers whenever you still haven't you still don't even know the relationship of the thigh to the to the knee or to the ankle and so I was like wow okay never even really thought of that okay so if we were working in paint we could turn around and you know blend these together here I think I need a bigger brush oh, should be big enough and there are properties to this brush too. Uh, strength. Set the strength a little higher. Anyway, blend it if you want. Make it smoother. But also, you know, it emulates paint. I like blending using the blender. Oops. Right there. Right now, I'm enjoying putting this uh, as if it were paint, you know, one layer at a time, one shade at a time. So we'll move to a smaller brush whenever we have a little bit more of what we want down. But in the meantime, I'm 
We're just going to go back and forth between these grays as we get what we want. And you'll find that, okay, well, my dark, my background is darker than I have it. So just let, layer it up again. Again, there's a there's a life here. There's an original act of creation that, you're, that you don't want to capture. It's like Taoism, right? Uh, uh, the mind, you know, attempts to conceive of the Tao. But this is like trying to pin a butterfly captured the husk but the flying is lost so we don't want to lose the flying we don't want to pin down the butterfly we want to we want to keep the activity or the drawing or the painting or whatever you know the work alive so we'll just keep going with black, back and forth light and dark Take that time. There we go. Back and forth, light and dark. Blood sugar meter. Again, if you'll notice, I'm making sure. just comparing shapes to each other. I'm not trying to draw an edge of a bowl or anything. I'm just trying to relate shapes to each other. And the painting dies when I stop doing that. Okay. Yeah, like this, this is even darker than what I have on here. So now, I'm going to go all the way down to black. I'm going to use all 10 value shades in something like this. So, even though there really is no such thing as black. And using black can kind of make a drawing or painting look unnatural. But I just kind of want to define the, those areas. See, that's too dark for that area. So and it's too dark for the background. So now we found our baseline in the background. So now let's work our way back up. So I like this. You know, we're going to cut back into this. Start. Instead of looking at dark shapes, now we're going to look at light shapes. So where's a light shape here? Like that. Really goes all the way across. in here A little too light. So now we want to really get close to our here. Let's pick this color and then just go, just nudge up from there. There's a lot of. subtle places in here that need a little bit more attention, maybe.
And again, just a little nudge up from there. And then we'll cut back into this. This shape right here. back of the go board it's not that dark so we'll pick another color here on here in just a little bit I still want to make sure I get these this value shape everywhere that it goes Right, so if you look at it as a series of value shapes, so every p color that I'm picking, I'm putting somewhere on here. Right. Okay. Go back down to this one. And just a little bit here. There. There. bottom right there a little bit here a little over here and that's we're getting close to it so actually I think no not quite see that that gray right here looks very light that gray over here looks dark but it's the same gray it's one of the Things you learn whenever you're uh, painting is much of color is uh, much of color perception is actually just a relation of colors by the mind. This brush is probably too big now. Or I'm ready to start putting on these kind of things. And define this these negative shapes in here. This one, this one, this one. A little bit here, just a little bit there. Anyway, obviously you get the idea. So it's layers and layers of refinement and then going back over. I mean, you can make additive processes uh, opaque, right? There are techniques for that. Uh, all I have to do here is adjust my opacity, right? Oh, that's my size. So let's bring it down my opacity. All right, so now I can come in here and you know, draw more.
go back down the spectrum again. because there's no real black again. No real black, no real white. So just ever closer approximations to either one of those. Uh, so then the question of success, you know, artistic success, well, okay. It still looks like a jumbled mess to me, right? But as you slowly kind of find your groove, you know, you start to see shapes and how they relate to each other instead of the bowls. You don't want to see the bowls. You want to see the shapes and how they relate to each other. So once you can kind of get past the bowls or the you know whatever the object is get past the object just see the relation of shapes really all you're doing is getting your hand to record the impressions on the visual field in the back of the retina I mean that's that's really what's happening if we were to just break it down so your brain turns it into you know an image of a cup or a flower right you have all these mechanisms for recognizing that stuff that we're trained with when we get past that training. We want to retrain ourselves to see things differently. And that's that is the crucial element. That is the crux of the biscuit. Learn to see things differently. Okay, so that's I think this is now taking shape. Right? So if you focus, like I'm talking about, on just relating shapes to each other, and just keep your focus on relating shapes to each other, and eventually the image will emerge. And that's the illusion. That is the very illusion we're trying to create. And that is what keeps it alive, right? Your ability—it's like a—it's like this backwards-turning motion. Uh, Jung called it. Carl Jung called it the enantiodromia, or the backwards-turning motion of human life. Perception and all the symbols we use in order to navigate the perceived world is backwards, in the relation to the spinning of the Earth. So the Earth is on one plane. And the world is another. Okay, so there we go. There's some shading techniques. That's uh, the, uh this is the additive. And then I, I think I might have, I think I might have lost the other one. Uh, hatching, or was just shading with line. Um, and then the watercolor is the subtractive. Let's see here, it is. It is unfortunately gone. Maybe it's right here, let's see. Nope. Okay, um, I think that's it for today. Let's look back at Corel and see what we got here. I have forgotten. Oh yeah, I didn't save it. Okay, so yeah, that's it for today. Uh, thank you guys very much for watching, and I hope you enjoy. Uh, I'll pick a topic for next time soon. Uh, it'll probably be putting all, everything together so far. So I'll set up another still life and we'll actually go through and finish the piece. And we'll spend, you know, a whole hour on just that one drawing. And uh, uh, we'll talk about kind of some of the 
the techniques, at looking, tying all these different techniques together. So you have the gesture, the blind contour, identifying negative shapes, uh, hatching, uh, additive blending, uh, subtractive, you know, uh, shading or, you know, image making, and uh, we'll pick one technique and we'll follow it all the way through. Okay, again, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy, and we will see you soon. Please leave comments or questions in the uh, uh, comment section, and I will be happy to reply. I have it all set up so I get notified whenever somebody comments. If you'd like to post pictures or anything like that, please go ahead and do so, and I'll be happy to you know, guide or direct or you know, suggest whatever, whatever you're at needing or whatever. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thanks, and have a great day.